family and friends. I am Pastor Kylie Slimmons and this is the day the Lord has made. We all have a reason to rejoice and be glad. I serve as the executive pastor here at the New Birth Church and on the behalf of our senior pastor, Dr. Jamal Harrison Bryant, we want to welcome you to this virtual experience. We are so honored and elated to make this connection with you. Today is going to be so good and refreshing. Listen, do me a favor. Why don't you share with someone that you're watching? Why don't you start a watch party right in the comment section that you're being blessed. Take a picture of you watching the service and hashtag new birth now now you know what time it is it's time to receive it's time to rejoice it is time to repost and share with your friends are you ready let's go into worship even now we're so grateful for what God did for us on the cross so let's sing about it yes God we bless your name song just says this you know it is simple it says hallelujah you have won the victory, yeah, hallelujah, you have won it all for me, and death could not hold you down, no, 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 for you are the risen King, yes, he is, he's seated in majesty. We're glad about it. You are the reason, King. Come on, sing it with us. Hallelujah.
He's mighty. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He's mighty. Will y'all help me say, I know who raised him. I know who raised me. I know who saved me. Say, I know who saved me. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. And he's mighty. And he's mighty. He's mighty. Say it. He's mighty. Wherever you are, raise it. Say it. He's mighty. He's mighty. He's mighty. He's mighty. He's mighty. He's mighty. Come on. Say it. He's mighty. He's mighty. I'm talking about Jesus. He's mighty. I'm talking about our Savior. He's mighty. I'm talking about our Lord. He's mighty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, and He's mighty, 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 mighty. Everybody lift it up. Say. Welcome to New Birth. I am Carrie Turner, your pastor of Emerging Generations, and we are so honored to have you with us today. Now is the time in our service where you have an opportunity to pass the peace. And we know that passing the peace right now is one of the most important things that we can do. Listen, how can you do it? We want you to pass the peace by sharing this broadcast. We want you to text your friends, invite them in to join us in our cyber sanctuary this morning. We are so honored that you are here. 
here and love that you joined us as a part of New Birth. So listen, as you are passing the piece, we also want you to hashtag it New Birth Now. Welcome to our service. And now New Birth, it's time for your video announcements. You know, this is a perfect time to catch up on your reading. Our May Book of the Month, Off Balance by Matthew Kelly, is available in our online Call to Conquer bookstore. Our bookstore has other great books, Bibles, and gifts to meet your spiritual needs. Just log on to newbirth.org. Click on the store tab. You can't be righteous and irresponsible. The Bible says that our people die from a lack of knowledge. As a consequence, at New Birth, we encourage you to please wash your hands, ask that you'll please wear your mask whenever you're going outside, and keep the appropriate social distance. We are one even while we're disconnected. God's going to do something awesome for people who are obedient. I'm grateful under God for your health, and I'm reminded He came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Also, meet us each Saturday at King's Table at our Family Life Center from 10 a.m. until 12 noon. We are blessing our community and those in need with free groceries. Volunteers, we ask that you arrive at 8.30 a.m. This is a no-contact drive through for your safety. Thank you to every medical professional, New Birth Cares, and with our partners, the Allen Institute, we'd like to assist you with rest and relaxation by providing free accommodations. Please call 770-696-9600 or email rsvp at newbirth.org to make a reservation. For your convenience, there are four ways to give your tithes and offerings. For you Android and iPhone users, there's Givelify. Log on to newbirth.org slash give. Push pay or just text NBGIVE to 77977. You know, during these trying times, we can all use an encouraging word. Please visit newbirth.org to read our daily devotions. They're uplifting and insightful and provide comfort and hope. And you don't want to miss it each weekday. It's our 15-minute daily inspirations. Just log on to newbirthlive.tv, Facebook, or YouTube at 12.30 p.m. Monday through Friday. Our pastors provide a daily dose of messages that will bless and elevate you. You don't want to miss it. This past Tuesday, our pastor taught us about convictions. So we just want to remind you to remove every distraction out of your life and intentionally make room for God and His presence. Yes, Lord. I will make room for you. I will prepare for two so Jesus. 
cancer. Somebody struggling with COVID. Somebody struggling with Corona. Sing, it's turning, y'all. It's turning around for me. And it won't always be like this. Hear us this morning. The Lord will perfect that concerning me. And you ought to declare it. Say it. Sooner or later, turning my favor. You ought to say, it's turning around. One more time, it's turning, oh, yeah. It's turning around for me. Lift your voice this morning and lift your hands and just say it's turning, say it. It's turning around for me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's turning. It's turning. Whatever you've been going through, it's turning. Whatever you've been dealing with, it's turning. I said it's turning. I said it's turning. I said it's turning. I said it's turning. You've got to believe it. You've got to receive it. It's turning around. It's turning around right now. Now you ought to give Jesus praise wherever you are. You ought to lift up your voice wherever you are. You ought to lift up your hands wherever you are. And just begin to make that place your sanctuary and just worship him. Glory to God. I don't know about you, but Jonathan and the music ministry of New Birth have messed up my week. Because I'm going to keep hearing this song in my head. It won't always be like this. Sooner or later, it's got to work in our favor. It can't always be like this, that we're always going to have to wear these surgical masks, always going to wear gloves, always afraid to hug and embrace, always outside of the sanctuary. It can't always be like this. I believe sooner or later, it's got to work in our favor. I hope that you've got that level of faith to believe that it's going to turn around for you for your community, for your family, for your city, and it's got to turn around for the whole world. On this Communion Sunday, the first Sunday in May, I'm excited because we're still in our same series. I want you to get your Bibles. I want you to journey with me uh, to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter one, I've been here the last couple of weeks, both on Sunday and in Bible study. We've only got another week to go. We're going to close it out on Mother's Day. Uh, but Exodus chapter 1, verse 20 and 22. Get your Bibles. You've been holding on to your remote all week long. Come on, put a Bible in your hand. Exodus chapter 1, verse 20 through verse 22. Here's what the Word of God says as translated in the New International Version. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people, every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw him into the Nile, but let every girl live. I want to uh, continue uh, preaching Midwife crisis doing the dirty work. Midwife crisis doing the dirty work. We have finally, after all of these years, identified the Grecan mythological creature known as the Grim Reaper. His true identity is COVID-19. It is claimed in America over one million cases 
and 60,000 lives. But outside of that which is found in the morgue and in the body bags, what we are discovering, the Grim Reaper, has killed jobs. It's killed jobs because just this week alone, six million people have filed unemployment. Over the span of COVID-19, it is daunting to know that over 30 million are now on the unemployment rolls. And we keep hearing the numbers, but we're not hearing the testimonies. Do you know what it's like to be faithful over your assignment, to be committed to your task, to be unwavering in your employment without any warning, you lose your job. It's not because of any corporate downsizing. It's not because you have beef with your boss, but because of this unknown, unseen predator known as COVID-19. And you find yourself sacked, dismissed, a fanciful word, furloughed. Not because of anything that you've done, but you've lost it. And so many people are reeling at the realization that what they invested their identity in is no longer attached to them. It's a sobering reality when you realize that you can lose your dream job but not lose yourself. You are not what you do. It's the Middle Eastern philosopher that says you are not a human being until you are a human doing. And so now that you don't have that job, do you still have your joy? Now that you don't have a place of employment, do you still have your peace? Now that you cannot check in, have you emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, have you clocked out? I'm telling you that this may be one of the greatest moments of your life, even though you didn't see it coming. All over the nation, all over the world, people began to put a pronouncement on 2020 that this was the year of clear vision. This is the year that you were going to be able to see it through. And now you can't see the forest for the trees. Maybe, just maybe, God had to have you put on the bifocals of your own understanding. He had to have you put on contact lenses of a clear conscience about what it is that he wanted to do with your life, do with your future, and do with your possibilities. I know that many of you don't want to hear it, especially why you keep checking the mailbox every day, waiting on the stimulus check. But can I offer to you on this Sunday morning that maybe you being fired is your greatest blessing. Maybe you losing your job is what was necessary for you to be able to find yourself. Several years ago, the founder of Apple Computers, Steve Jobs, gave the commencement address at Samford University. And while he was talking to those who were waiting on edge to finally receive their degrees, he said to them, lamenting and bemoaning, but really expressing how it is that losing his job saved his life. After it is that he was fired from Apple computers, he found the woman in whom he would spend the rest of his life with. After he was fired, he established Pixar Entertainment. It was the only company in the world through animation did more business than Disney. After he got fired, because of his toxic style of leadership, he re-examined how it is that he led and realized they weren't the problem, he was the problem. And making the greatest turnaround history in business, he went back and led the company he was fired from. He, out of his own mouth, testifies that being fired made him a better person, made him a better man, and made him a better leader. 
like Joseph, going through your hardship of life is not going to make you bitter. It's going to make you better. Maybe you had to go through this, climb up the rough side of the mountain just so you could find out your raison d'etre, your purpose, your assignment, your calling, your vocation, and the will of God for your life. Maybe your job is what you wanted, but it wasn't what he wanted for you. Yes, in this moment, you're looking at me with a pharaoh brow, but I want to underscore for you today that you are unemployed, but you are not unloved. You're unemployed, but you are not uncovered. You're unemployed, but you are not unprotected. God had something in mind for you, something in store for you, and maybe, just maybe, he had to circumnavigate the circumstances of your life because it is the only way you would be able to hear my voice right now. And so now that I have your attention, I want to bring it to uh, what it is that I found in Ecclesiastes, which is a book of wisdom, that there's nothing new under the sun. I don't want you to think that you're the first one to lose your job that you're the first one to be terminated with no cause, for you to be the first one to have your finances disrupted without any warning. As you very well know, I've been plowing in Exodus chapter one over the last three weeks. And in Exodus chapter one, I found something intriguing and arresting. I found that uh, there was a Pharaoh who uh, arose and he knew nothing about Joseph, nothing about dreamers. And so he's trying to kill off those who are the children of dreamers. Many of you have need to know that this is the area, the arena, the space that you're going to tap into the creativity side of you. That what it is that God is pulling out of you doesn't even have an existing job description. They're gonna to have to create positions because of what it is that you bring to the table. There's something about your creative prowess that refuses to allow you to color inside the lines. Joseph was a dreamer, and the person who's in charge now can't tolerate dreamers. You've always been somebody to dance to your own beat. You've always been somebody who created and broke your own rules. You've always been somebody who refused to go along just to get along. So here comes this Pharaoh who hates the children of dreamers. He says, I've got to kill them off before they grow, before they multiply, before they expand. There is a death sentence on your children simply because they are not narrow-minded, simply because they have a large, vacuous dreamscape. And so because they don't learn like other children, they've consistently tried to put them on medication, put them in special education classes, tried to in fact typecast them that they don't have the tools or the skill set or the capacity to learn. There's nothing wrong with your child. They are just born to be dreamers, to be creative. And this pharaoh, this governor, this legislator who emerges who has it out for dreamers, hires two assassins who we know affectionately as midwives. And these two assassins, these uh, clinicians that we find in Exodus chapter one, Shafira and Pua, they are hired to do a job. And the job that they are hired to do is to kill all of the male children and throw them into the river. I told you on Tuesday night, they accepted the job, but they're convicted by their own conscience. And when they're convicted by their own conscience, they make up in their mind, I am not going to do the enemy's dirty work. I feel like I'm preaching to an aggregation of you today who are walking away from the devil's devices of destroying other people's lives. I'm not gonna do the devil's dirty work. 
I'm not going to assassinate people's character. I am not going to assassinate people's dreams. I am not going to butcher believers' self-esteem. I'm not going to tear apart other people's idea. I refuse to abort what other people are trying to birth because I know how the enemy viciously tried to kill my assignment. I refuse to do the enemy's dirty work. And today, I can't get fired from the enemy. I quit. And I need you to know, in that same passion, that I want you to fire everything in your mind that is working against you. I need you to fire the thought that you're not good enough. I need you to fire the premonition that you don't have what it takes. I need you to fire that recessive gene that makes you feel like because nobody else was able to accomplish it, you're not going to be able to do it. I need you to fire the conviction you're too old or too young to just get started. Fire it. Fire the enemy of your destiny and let them know you might have gotten my friends, might have gotten my family, you might have gotten my spouse, but I refuse to let you kill that which God has planted inside of me. The reality is that they, they refuse to do the job. They wouldn't kill the male children. And they got called in by their supervisor. And when they got called in by their supervisor, they were asked one critical question. And the critical question was, why didn't you do the job? And that's what the enemy is asking you today. Why is it that you refuse to be depressed, refuse to be anxious, refuse to be stressed out, refuse to surrender? They kept asking the question the Philistines did of Samson, what makes you so strong? There is an unparalleled, undeniable strength that you possess that people don't know what to do with it but you keep emerging, you keep fighting forward, you keep leaning in, you keep refusing to throw in the towel. Why? Because how in the world are you gonna fire yourself? You got a job, you got a responsibility, you got a ministry, you got a nonprofit, you got an idea that you've got to work. All of the business structures are shut down but nothing can close your ingenuity. Nothing can stop your bright idea. Nothing can disrupt your concept. Nothing is going to throw off the favor of God that rests on your life. These two midwives, they were called in. How come you didn't do the job? And I want you to lean in and hear what they say. They say it's something different about these women, these chosen with women, these anointed women, these called out, these set apart women that are not like everybody else. And what you have to understand is that in that time, whenever it is that you disobeyed the law of the ruling property, you were subject to death. But Shafir and Pua were not put to death for not doing their job they were just terminated. The Bible reminds you and I, and we're going to be taking communion in a few moments, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Because you didn't do your job of being a believer, of being committed, of maintaining your vows and your commitment, we all should have died, but he spared our life and gave us another opportunity. While I was praying for you this week, while I was carrying you, carrying you in my spirit, God dropped something in me that I've got to release to you. I want you to write it down. I want you to tweet it. I want you to put it on your social media page. I want you to type it right under where it is that I'm speaking. Here's what God said for me to tell you. He said, Jamal, tell the people of God that while they are not working, I am working. While they are not working, I'm working. He said, 
This is what God said to me. He said, I had to get them out of a job so I could do my job. I'm preaching better than what y'all are shouting. He said, I had to make them lose their job so that they could understand that I never stopped working on their behalf. And do you not know that all day, all night, the angels are working for you. So while you've been under quarantine, watch how God has worked. While you have been out of a job, while you've been displaced, while money's been tight, look at how God's been working for you. He's been working for your health. So right now, you're not on a ventilator. He's been working for your resources so that you're able to say, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging for bread. He's been working on your children. By the power of the Holy Ghost, he is breaking that spirit of dishonor and disrespect that's in your child. He's working in your spouse so that they're falling in love again afresh and anew. He's working on your idea. The thing that they shut the door on before, they're going to be looking for you in the future. God is working for you in this moment. The people who don't like you are going to have to work for you. God said, I put them out of a job so that I can go to work for them. Here's something strategic and significant that happens in Exodus chapter one. In Exodus chapter one, he asked of these midwives, why didn't you do the job? And never gives them a pink slip, never writes them up, never terminates their contract, but watch how he pivots and goes to verse number 20 and speaks to everybody in the land and said, all right, because they didn't do the job, I need all of you to find the firstborn baby boys and throw them in the river. In spite of them not doing their job, I need you to catch this, they're still irreplaceable. There are people who are going to be sorry how they mishandled you. They're going to be apologetic on how they released you. They didn't even understand their, your value until they tried to replace you. That's shouting good news for somebody right now. I am telling you that every day on the news and in my car, I keep hearing essential workers only. And how does that make people feel who are not called in? What is the psychological scars that are left? What are the emotional strands that are left for those who are not called in? They're made to feel as if they are not essential. But God had you log in on this Sunday just so that you would know you are not essential to the job, but you are necessary for my assignment. I need you to take on the spirit, the cloak and the garment of David and encourage yourself. This is not for your neighbor. You ain't supposed to be touching people anyway. I need you to lay hands on yourself and declare out loud, I am necessary. You didn't hear what I just said. I am necessary. I may not be essential to other people, but I am necessary to what God is doing in the earth realm. Bishop Paul Sylvester Morton sings a song that says, whatever you're doing in this season, don't do it without me. I am telling you that it will not work until you get to the table. It will not take off until you are invited. It will not be met with success until they tell you about it. It will not find the glory of God until they get your buy-in. You are necessary for what God is doing. I said a couple of years ago, and it brings to my remembrance in this hour, you are going from overlooked to overbooked. What it is that they thought that they could do without you, you now have got to be written into the plan. There was a man of God by the name of Samuel who was given the assignment, go find the ruler of Israel. And he knocks on the door of a man by the name of Jesse's house. And Jesse brings out all of his sons. And when he brings out all of the sons, watch this, the oil will not pour. It will not pour because who is supposed to carry it is not included when Jesse thought all of the essential workers were present. 
But Samuel knew he had heard the word of God that who I'm looking for is in this house. They weren't called with the first list, but they are necessary even though the family didn't think they were essential. Preach Jamal, I'm doing the best I can. And they had to go find somebody else. Bring them in. Because even though the prophet didn't know who it was, the family didn't know who it was, the oil knew who it was. The oil is waiting for those of us who are necessary for a move of God. And when they called them back in, hear the assignment. Put all of the firstborn males into the Nile River and let them drown. I'm here rejoicing. I'm trying to buckle into my stool because what the enemy thought you were drowned in, you are about to float in. They threw you in a circumstance, a situation and a condition that nobody thought you'd be able to keep your head above water but I'm telling you, you getting ready to float. The blessing of being able to float is greater than having the capacity to swim. Because to swim, you gotta be able to kick your legs. You gotta move your arms. But to float, all you've gotta do is trust that it's gonna work out. The amazing thing about floating, please don't miss this. The amazing thing about floating is the only way you can float is if you take the symbol of the cross. My friends, when we take communion today, I want you to know you are floating because of the power of his grace, because of the power of the cross, because of the might of his crucifixion, because of the oblation that was made for sinners like you and I. I got good news for you. If you can hear my voice, if your Wi-Fi has not failed, this is not a worship service. This is not a virtual encounter. This is a job fair. God said, I've been looking for some people who will work for me. I need some midwives who will do my dirty work. What do you mean, God, do your dirty work? Those who will love the least of these. Those who will make a sacrifice for those who have been disenfranchised and thrown apart and dismissed by their own family. I need some midwives who ain't trying to be cute, but understand I got to do it for the glory of my God. Do you know how many people jeopardize their lives right here in Atlanta, trying to get their hair done, trying to get their nails done, trying to look cute by staying home? God says, I need some people who are willing to take on the ugliness of the assignment, who understand what I'm calling them to do, there's no fanfare. There's no parade. There's no great mu musical behind their name. But because they were willing to get down in the pig pen and rescue people out of the ugliness of life, that's who I'm looking for. Those who will do my dirty work, who can say the only way I'm able to love the unlovable is because I got love, blood on me. The only way, reason why I stopped and I bless the homeless because I got blood on me. The only reason why I encourage those who are right on the brink of losing their mind is because I got blood on me. I need some midwives who will do the dirty work. I know you might have lost your job, but you didn't lose your mind. You might have lost your position, but you didn't lose your place in the kingdom. You might have lost that corner office but you are right in the center of God's intention. God wants to do something amazing in your life. I'm grateful you're with me on this communion Sunday. In a few moments, we're gonna celebrate the sacraments together. But before we do that, there's somebody under the sound of my voice who needs to get saved. Somebody who needs to give their life over to God. Somebody who has gotta declare, I yield, I yield, what must I do to be saved? The old church mothers used to say, God's got no hands but our hands. He's got no feet but our feet. Use me, Lord, to show someone the way. To enable them to say, my storage is empty and I am available to you. 
You know what I need? The army is looking for a few good men. New birth is looking for a few good midwives who don't mind feeding the hungry, loving the unlovable, praying for the forgotten, encouraging those who are discouraged. That's the kind of ministry you want to be a part of, the kind of church you want to align with. I want you to join New Birth and I want you to do it right now. I want you to become a part of this ministry. I want to be your pastor. I want Jesus to be your Lord. You know who I'm talking to? If you ever lost a job, lost the internship, lost a position, ever lost your place, this sermon was for you today. Come on, I want you to join us. Be a part of New Birth. We're at ground zero. I'm telling you, what better way to join? You ain't even got to walk the aisle. You ain't even got to worry about all these people looking at you. You can do it right now online. Come on, be a part of this amazing move of God. And while you're moving, here's what I want you to do. I couldn't wait till Sunday. You know what I did? I gave my offering this morning before I ever got to this place of worship. Those of you who ever encountered Jehovah Jireh, to say, you know what my testimony is? Favor is better than finances. That when my check ran out, grace never did. On this, the first Sunday in May, I want you to follow the law of first mention of what I do at the first of the month will follow me through the rest of the month. There's several different outlets by which you can give right below me on this screen. Give the five, push to pay, text to give, even on our own secure website, newbirth.org. I want you to give right now. I want you to give right now. In spite of your condition, in spite of your employment, in spite of your placement, you might have lost your job, but you didn't lose your salvation. You didn't lose your relationship with God. I say all the time, tithing is an act of the prophetic. I'm giving based off of where I am now, believing where I'm going next. So I don't want you to even give based off of what your situation is today. I want you to give in expectation that something good is getting ready to hit my life. Our music ministry already told you sooner or later, it's gonna work in your favor. It's gonna turn around for you. Not just your employment, not just your job, not just your health, but also your finances. Come on, I want you to give right now. I want you to sow right now. I want you to tithe right now, even while we're outside of the house of God, we're not outside of his faith. Come on, let's give. In one moment, we're about to share communion, knowing that Jesus gave the ultimate sacrifice for all of us. And now he's only asking for us a decibel, 10% of what he's given. He wants us to give back. Something good is getting ready to happen. Come on, let's celebrate sacred communion together. Our music ministry is coming back now to prepare our hearts, our minds, and our spirits to go right around the cross to remember the greatest offering that was ever given. For it reaches yes, yes. to the highest mountain. Yes, Come on, help me say, and it blows. Everybody say it. And it blows to the Lord.
Dr. King said that the real measure of a man is not where they stand in times of convenience. I'm believing with all that we're seeing around the world under COVID-19, we're plagued with this pandemic, we still trust in the power of the blood of the Lamb. To know 2,020 years ago, God already knew that this was coming down the pike. Of all the weeks that we have been out of our sanctuary, I was reminded that we never paused once to share in the sacred elements of communion. I'm gonna challenge and charge you to please go find uh, uh, some beverage in your home, ask that you'll find a wafer, a piece of bread, ask that you'll please find a drink. I want you to bring your family together uh, so that we can in fact celebrate what it is uh, that Jesus did for us. Uh, what an amazing revelation that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. The prophet said that even while we were in our mother's womb, he knew who we were. We ought to take tremendous delight that while it is that we have been uh, sequestered into our homes for over 50 days, that he knows every thought, he knows every word, he knows every deed. He is so into us that he knows every follicle of hair that is on our head. And in spite of all of our shortcomings, he decided that we were worth dying for. And because he died for us, the very least we can do is live for him. I hope that you'll celebrate and you'll share with us uh, this sacred celebration of communion as often as you remember, you ought to do this. The reality is that there are a whole lot of people who were alive before this pandemic started, who have now transitioned to go on to glory. And yet God saw fit to allow us to stay in the earth a little while longer because there's still work for us to complete. When Jesus pulled all of the disciples into the upper room, he pulled out a loaf of bread and he lifted it up in front of all of them. And he said to them, this is my body that is broken for you. I want you to get a piece of bread. I want you to get a cracker. I want you to get a potato chip. I want you to get a biscuit. I want you to get it in your hand. And I want you to look at it because it represents the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon his shoulders and by his stripes we are healed. I stand before you today knowing that COVID-19 thought it had the power to break you, and yet you're still standing. Would you break it right in your hand? It's the body of Christ that was broken for sinners like you and me. And after you would have done so, take and eat. He then pulled out a flask of wine. That's that you'll find juice, that's that you'll find water, find something in your home. Share it with your family, your relatives, your neighbors, that we would have something sacred. Please, I don't want you to feel ill at ease. Isn't it wonderful to know that in the first communion, they weren't in church. They were in a home, in the upper room. And so he pulled out that wine and said, this is my blood that is shed for you and it is shed for me. We're grateful that God over these 53 days has forgiven us of the sin of our thoughts, 
where we gave up on God, where we were frustrated about our location, about our situation, where we did all kinds of things in our minds that were not pleasing unto him. But the Bible gives us the prescription. If you confess your sins, he's faithful, he's just. He'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. For the blood that was shed for sinners like Jamal Harris and Bryant, and just like you, would you please take and drink? We're renewing our covenant for the next 30 days. And I'm believing that this sacrament that we've shared together is going to sustain your family, cover your family, going to fortify your family until we share in communion again on the first Sunday in June. I want to tell you what my faith says. My faith says you're going to be alive to share. My faith says in 30 days, your family is going to be healthy enough to participate. My faith says in 30 days when we have communion again, your song is going to be the storm has passed over. Hallelujah. We give God glory. We give him praise and we give him thanksgiving. situation is. Pastor, why do you always come back and offer Christ to us? It's important because there's not enough opportunities for you to be connected. I want you to be a part of the greatest church on the planet and it's important. And if you want to do that right now, just go to joinnewbirth.org and we welcome you into our essential family. On top of that, we want you to be able to sow a seed. Why? Because I realize the blessing of investing in God's kingdom. You can do it right now, right where you are. If you just text NB Give to 77977, you can invest and watch God turn your situation around. More importantly, you can't leave this place without the benediction. There's a blessing over your life. If you just lift your hands and repeat after me, walk with God and he'll walk with me. Talk with God. He'll talk with me. Listen to God. He'll listen to me. Love God because he first loved me. Now unto him and him alone who's able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before the throne. May God make you sleepless until you help somebody. May God make you restless until you help yourself. May God irritate you until you have enough sense to worship him. And may God bless you so abundantly that you got to start giving stuff away. I believe it that now, henceforth, and forevermore. And the blessed people of God said, amen. It's the first Sunday. Go out while you joined, while you gave, and now you can jam. We love you. Peace.